everyone, this is Lori Ann with Mystic Center. And Mystic Center is a outreach for the Lord to move in the power of the Lord. Because it's not by might and not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And it is in an effort to allow the Lord to come in. So it's not controlled by any person wanting your money or wanting you to join my church. Um, I don't want you to follow me. I want you to follow the Lord because the Lord is your good shepherd. And the Lord has his eye on you and you know his voice. And many people are trapped in cults and trapped in religious systems and trapped in the world and philosophies of the world and God is your good shepherd. The Lord Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah is your good shepherd and he wants to draw you into himself, into his temple that was created when he died on the cross. There is no more temple. It is only a spiritual temple where we worship him. And when we are gathered, two or three are gathered in his name, then he is in the midst of us. So having said that, I want to teach on being the bridge, um, uh, restoring the breach and the gap uh, between Jew and Gentile, which is vital to understand this concept in because we're going to enter into um, more warfare over the Jews. And you can see that Islam is against Israel. There's a lot of great people in Islam. There's a lot of the Lord's people in Islam. Many of those people will be saved and they will know the Lord Jesus Yeshua the Messiah as their savior and it's really important to understand that we don't fight against flesh and blood we fight against principalities and powers that rule in dark places and they're real it doesn't matter if you believe me they're real <laughs> there's angels and there's demons and a third of the angels fell from heaven and they became the demons and a principality is like a large angel. It's like one of the warring angels. And they set their thrones up over territories. I mean, think about it. The spirits just move around from kingdom to kingdom, person to person. They don't die. They're still here because they haven't been cast into the abyss forever and ever yet. So think about Hitler and his regime and the war against Israel that happened in that war, but also against true believers and also against outcasts and gypsies and people who were seemed like they were less than many, many, many people were killed in that. But when Hitler died and his regime came down, the spirits, the de demons that were operating behind him didn't just disappear. They just moved. They moved and they set up their power somewhere else. So one time God was saying to me, you know, in Revelation, it talks about um, you, to the, one of the churches, it says, you know where Satan's seat is. And the Lord was saying to me, you know where Satan's seat is. And I'm like, no, I don't know where Satan's seat is. And he's like, no, you know where Satan's seat is. And I got the picture of the cross of Jesus, our Messiah. And... If you were Satan, say you're the devil and you want to deceive the world and you have one agenda and that is to deceive and kill the people of God and then trap everyone you can into your abyss with you later because you're jealous of God, where are you going to sit? You're going to sit as close to the cross as you can get, as close to the cross as you can get. You're going to sit in a religious seat if you can. You're going to pervert the cross, like the swastika was a perverted cross. You're going to come in the name of God, if you're Satan, and kill God's people. I mean, basically that's it, right? Everybody who's out there 
doing drugs or you're out there worshiping idols, I mean, and everything like that. I mean, yeah, Satan is active in all of that. He wants you to worship idols. He loves you to worship idols because you're trapped and you're not free. And you have no freedom with idols. So I don't care if you have 500 idols. I don't care if you have 1,000 idols. It's not going to help you. And I pray that you'll know the Lord so that you can disband those idols, whatever they are. And they could be anything in your life. But, I mean, it's sickening (laughs) when you think about it. Because the Lord is the one to be feared. And he is the one to be worshipped. And him alone. Because he's the good shepherd. He cares about our souls. I was trapped in demonic activity, and I didn't even believe in demons. So it doesn't matter if you believe in them. They're trying to kill you, (laughs) and they're trying to deceive your mind. Now, there's only one battle going on in the world, one battle, major battle, and it's Satan against God. Okay, so we're in a spiritual battle, and but it's Satan warring against the people of God. So you've got to know who are the people of God. Well, the Bible is really clear that he chose Israel as a nation unto himself to show his faithfulness and to show who he is. He came as a Jewish person. Jesus was a Jew. He was the Messiah who walked among us. And he then chose any person who would call on his name from any nation, any pagan culture, Gentile, Greek, any any pagan nation to be grafted in and we become the Israel of God. So Satan really only hates Israel, true Israel, literal Israel, and Israel of God. Now, will every person in Israel be saved? No, only those of the father Abraham who um, God has sealed for himself. And he has sealed them for himself. And he has sealed us for himself. But what I want to talk about today is that, well, God wants me to be as a bridge to build the one new man, to understand the times that we talked about in 1967. There was a shifting of the times. The end of the Gentile age was over. That was it. 1967, the Jews took back Jerusalem. Luke 21, 24 says clearly that Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So know where to to go in that. Thinking about becoming a priest, I would probably counsel you not to do that at this point. Thinking about going to seminary, probably not. Unless they're understanding the roots of our faith, understanding the time that's on us regarding Israel, regarding the sons of Abraham, sons of Ishmael, And so what I feel like is a bridge, and I want to talk to you about the grafted-in branch. Um, In Romans 11, 17, well, let's start with Romans 11, 18, maybe I'll go back. It says, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, you bear not the root, but the root bears thee. Okay, that's King James. (laughs) Well, there's other Bibles out there that are really great. Um, There's a new translation called the Scriptures. I recommend you find a copy of that. I'll try to link it to my site so you can find it. There's a Jewish Bible, a new translation. It's been out for a little while by David Stern called the Complete Jewish Bible. You can see that. Um, It's really enriching to read these translations because they bring back the Hebrew names of God Um, there's things you'll understand in a deeper way if you get another translation. So I read several translations. Um, I'm having the King James up right now because I'm called to, to tell you Gentiles who are grafted in, it's like I'm making a bridge for you to understand about Israel and the roots of our faith. Because when we were cut off from the roots of our faith, And that happened over the first three centuries after Jesus came and died and rose again and ascended to heaven. We became, as we cut the roots off, we became a tree that is very wobbly. 
and is not drawing on the true well and because the roots draw deep into the soil and they draw the water and then you can grow up and you're strong and if you've ever seen a grafted in branch it's a beautiful thing isn't that that you can graft in a branch to a tree so i had a tree in my yard and i love this tree because it was a symbol to me of israel and the israel of god because the, there was a grafted in branch quite near the bottom near the trunk and it had grown simultaneous with the tree as it grew and it was a really beautiful picture but you could always see where it was grafted in now imagine that tree with that grafted in branch and imagine there being no roots ah it's like a scary thing isn't it the the grafted branch would probably be the first to go it's probably the weakest and now the roots still hold up the trunk but then you have these branches of israel who have been separated are from from understanding their messiah but when it happened in 1967 that the age of the gentiles was over the blindness came off their eyes the veil is now off their eyes is it off all their eyes right this second no everything doesn't happen in a second except maybe the rapture might happen in a second but don't count on the rapture you better be prepared if you're going to have to go through some perilous times which i believe we may have to go through because god doesn't do anything unless he reveals his secrets to his prophets and i'm a prophet and he usually reveals to me the major things that are going on in the world i have an idea of them it's not like it's like we prophesy in part and we know in part i'm not jeremiah or i'm not ezekiel but i am a modern day prophet and i understand the the times and the things that god is doing so Get the picture of the grafted in branch and don't boast against their root. And don't, um, we, we have to understand that it's the time now that we are to be reconciled and dig back into the root and into the depth of our faith. We were ripped off by not having that root. And I want to, it's a long history of how it was broken off. Um, but I want to say that we were ripped off as Gentile believers by not understanding the roots of our faith. Even right now, the Feast of Sukkot is happening. Do you even know what Sukkot means? Do you even understand when they're setting up those temporary dwellings, if you're in a Jewish neighborhood, what that means? It's absolutely beautiful when you understand the feast. And we'll have to talk more about Sukkot at another time. But it's also prophetic that the Lord fulfills the feast of Israel. They're like the manifold wisdom of God. Jesus ultimately is our feast, and we, we eat him, we drink him, but we don't understand the feast. Like the feast, the feast of Sukkot being the latter harvest will be the prophetic latter harvest when he prophetically brings all the souls into himself that are going to be saved, and he returns to the earth. So now I, in my Gentile way, wanted to celebrate the Feast of Israel. And we'll talk more about each feast at a certain time. But I just didn't uh, purely, I read the Bible, read where it said about the feast, and tried to practice them at my house. I didn't do them the Jewish way, and I didn't do them the Christian way. I just did them the way, as I read the Bible, I felt like I should do the feast. Mostly it was a gathering and had the Lord be present. And it was really incredibly uh, beautiful. I mean, I've had Arabs, Persians, Israelis, Christians, um, people from all over the world under the same roof at the same time, hearing worship music, feeling that God is somehow present, not clear, not completely understanding why they're in the same room together and feeling the love and presence of God, but it's because God honors his feast. So it's, it's just like, you have to get into this. If you're going to be a believer, there's nowhere to go in the Gentile church anymore. There's nowhere to go in the pagan church. There's no depth there. You won't find any depth there. You've got to come out and understand and get deep into your roots of the faith. 
there is incredibly beautiful Bible studies that you can do, and I'll try to link to some of those online. I don't necessarily have to be the one that's interpreting the Hebrew for you, although I have taken Hebrew, and I have done some of that, but I feel like I'm more like the bridge. Like, how do you do this in a real way? Like, how do you actually implement these things into your life? So it's really important that we do this because when the, the church broke itself off from the roots of the faith, it allowed it to become places where Satan could sit and war against the Jews. And I have this great little book here, uh, How the Cross Became a Sword. See that? Okay. Um, really simple uh, book. But let me just read this passage to you. When Hitler arose on the scene, he somehow was able to say and had thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people follow him and Christians. Did you know that when he rose up, the church was very strong and many, many Christians went with Hitler. Were they true believers? I hope not but they were deceived. And when he, he said, hence today, I believe that I am acting in accordance with the almighty creator by defending myself against the Jew, that I am fighting for the work of the Lord. Ah, it's scary. But when you think about it, doesn't it sound like the people right now who are in Islam and think that they, if they fight against the Jew and the Christian, it's for the Lord. Um, a lot of Christians are deceived. And, and you better be careful because if you fight against God's people, you're fighting against God. And that's a scary thing. But this is a little book about how the cross became a sword. And... I feel like it's really significant if to know the history of the last 2,000 years of the church so you can understand why doesn't your Jewish neighbor want to hear you? Why doesn't your Muslim neighbor want to hear you? Frankly, Muslim people, they don't understand the Catholic God or the Lutheran God. They don't understand that at all. These are these are people who are from tribes that lived in the same area, all from the Middle East, most of them. They understand about fighting over the well for water. They understand about um, there being a Jewish Messiah and the people. But when you start really understanding the, the roots of the faith and you share it in that way, a person who's from Islam understands it in that way. They can, they understand it. And I'm not sure how, but I know it's because the Lord, it's the Lord restoring. He not only wants to restore and take the veil off of Israel, he wants to restore Ishmael. And he wants to make amends with the brothers. Um, I know we're going way back here, but this is how it is. You know, this is what I believe. Now, there's a movie out right now, uh, a documentary on religion, and it's brilliant. It's a brilliant movie. Um, I don't agree with everything that the person who did it says, but I thought it was very informative. I was sad by the Christians that were interviewed on the movie because they were very, for the most part, ignorant, sometimes didn't even know the word. Um, but I'm sure they were chosen for the purpose of how the person wanted to portray his subject. Um, the end of the movie shows possibly how the Antichrist will be warring against us in the last days. Basically, will Zionism, or if you believe there's only one way to God, I mean, we're going to be standing in the way of world peace, right? Because you you got to have, you can't believe in one way if you're going to have world peace. you got to believe in all ways. So it's going to get rough. 
and we need to be prepared. But um, but I thought that it was a, a really good way to see the gap. The movie I'm talking about, I thought it was a great way to see the gap between the Jew and the Gentile. Because this person that's doing the film, he says he's honestly looking for God. So, but he was raised by a Catholic and a Jew. And where does the language come together for that? Where do they understand? Now, if they wouldn't have become pagan, the church wouldn't have become pagan, they would be celebrating the feast, be celebrating Passover. And it would be very much easier for a Jewish person to understand if you as a believer were setting up your sukkah in the backyard, your temp your temporary dwelling, and you were celebrating the feast, and you had kept the calendars of the harvest and the moon, and you were understanding that, wouldn't it be easy to share with your Jewish neighbor? But the gap became so great that not only did it, we don't understand each other, we Christians killed the Jews in the name of God. And I say we because I take full responsibility for it, that my hands are covered with blood. I don't want to be in that covering. I really don't want to be under that covering. I want to be under the covering of the God of Israel. And the God of Israel is, is a God who has showed himself in a certain way for a certain, uh, for his, his ways. And his ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. But they're absolutely perfect, and everything God does is perfect. I really believe that. And so more and more as we understand it, you'll you'll feel that you'll feel you're connected to the roots again and you'll feel the water. But first we have to be not high minded, but we have to be humble. Because we're the grafted in branch. And I want to kind of tell you how God did it with me. Um, it was really great. I mean, I never really understood Calvinism or Augustine or I didn't really understand the, the monks, the Benedictine monks and everything, although I respect a lot of them. I love St. Francis, and I, I, really, I really respect a lot of the zealous believers, even though they may have been trapped under one of those systems or another, and they were also persecuted against violently. Um, in the name of God, many believers have been killed, not just Jews. So it's the war. It's against... Israel and the Israel of God. There's only one battle going on. Super simple. One battle. <laughs> and there's only one battle going on to trap men and women into false belief systems rather than having intimate fellowship with God, the Creator. And if you're in intimate fellowship with God, the Creator, and you were deep into your roots of, the, of Hebrew faith, you would never kill a Jew. And you would never kill a true believer. So, um, for me, what happened was I had been really hurt by the church um, because I'm a true believer and I'm zealous for God. I'm going to follow him. I like, I speak in tongues and I pray for people and they're healed. I have prayed for people who have been raised from the dead. I have been completely set free. I move in prophecy. Um, I'm not into your theology unless it's to say, hey, God's moving in you and you're full of the word of God, you then let him move, you know? I, I believe that God calls men and women. There was a great prophetess that rose up named Deborah during a time when God wanted to rise her up. There were many, many women in the early church who were leaders and who had church in her house. So I'm not into any of that just vying for position. Um, I, I really believe God wants to be your shepherd, and you should just follow him only. And if he tells you to go to a church, go. And if he tells you to go somewhere else, go. I really believe he is, when you're in church, there's only a number of people who are actually fellowshipping with God anyway. You might have 100 people show up, but there's only the ones who were gathered there in his name are having fellowship with him. That may seem confusing to you, but 
to me, it's black and white. A lot of people go to church for all different kinds of reasons, and they have all different kinds of gods and their priority. A lot of people's god is money. So you're a slave to that, and you're not worshiping and fellowshipping with God if you are into your money. And in that movie that I was talking about, it's sad. I mean, there was a person there, and he didn't even know the word. I think he's got thousands and thousands of followers. And he was talking about Jesus who would want us to wear fine clothes because he wore fine linen. And I just don't see that in the Bible. I don't see Jesus being like that. And, oh, my goodness, there was a priest interviewed um, in at the Vatican, outside the Vatican. And he said there was a survey done recently in Rome of who prays to what saints, like how many people prayed this saint or that saint. And Jesus showed up six, six on the list. He's the sixth person they pray to. So, wow, <laughs> that's scary. I'd be scared if I were a person who prayed to somebody other than my Lord and my Savior, my God, who came in the flesh and died for me. I'd be terrified because I wouldn't be prepared with my wedding clothes that I need for the last day and the wedding feast. I'd be scared if I was worshiping money. I'd be pretty terrified. I'd be scared if I was worshiping anything, even my comfort, even my children, even um, anything that God says that we need to forsake or we can't follow him. We can't really be worthy of him. And I'm not worthy of him, but I want to be worthy of him. And so I continually am zealous for God. Now, I was in a church where I was zealous for God, and it wasn't suiting their lifestyle. It wasn't suiting what they wanted. Um, so they told me not to pray, not to pray in tongues, I, to close my mouth, you know, whatever. And so it was, it was a difficult season of my life. But after that, I was free and wandering I said Lord where, what do you want and I had a vision of a person from Israel a man from Israel and specifically what he looked like and, and I felt like God said when I meet the person to listen to him be not high-minded but listen to him so about a year later maybe not quite a year it was my birthday and I decided I wanted to be alone with God on my birthday and so I was out um, just at a plaza where there's music and things. And I, I was so with God and I'm fellowshipping with God. And I was just so happy that he got me to my birthday. And this man from Israel came up and he said, do you know any kosher restaurants? Um, I said, no, I don't. I didn't even really know what kosher was. So... I didn't think much of it, even though he looked like the person of my vision. But, you know, I'm full of pride like any other person and guarded. It's not like I'm going to talk to anybody. I usually, there's always people who want to talk to me, especially men. And I always have to be really guarded. But he looked like the person of my vision. And so he kept asking me, do you know any kosher restaurants? Do you know any kosher restaurants? You know, and, and um, you know, trying to talk to me. So I just stood back a second and I asked God. I said, Lord, who is this person and what am I supposed to know? So I got a picture in my mind because I get visions from the Lord. And I've learned to listen to the Lord very clearly because I've suffered a lot. I have a loss of hearing. I've, I've, I separated myself from a lot of the media and a lot of the teachings um, in, the, in even the church for a number of years, but mostly because I was suffering. So I was in bed. Um, but I was listening. I wanted to listen to God because I feel like he has a lot to say if he could just find people to listen. So I've learned to listen. I'm tuned in and he speaks through his word. Nothing is ever contrary to his word, but he speaks in visions, dreams, and there, there'll be whole other teachings on that. But, um, I stood back a little and I got a vision of a picture of a gift, a birthday gift. And it was my birthday. And so I said to the person, you know, I, I, I think I'll help you find a kosher restaurant. And so we started walking and 
a few blocks away and he said, why did you end up talking to me? Because I, you didn't seem like you really wanted to talk to me at first. And I said, because it's my birthday and God showed me that you're a gift from my father. So I figure whatever the conversation is, it's going to be a gift for me. And he was stunned. His face went, why? He said, my name is Avi Shai, which means in Israel, Father's gift. He said, my name is Father's gift. He said, God told you that? I said, yeah, he did. And um, now we're supposed to move into our fullness so that it provokes the Jew to jealousy because they're actually the royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, which we have been grafted into but they, they are more interested in when you're really moving in the spirit of God, you'll find that they'll be interested. And I was wishing like in that movie I just saw, I was wishing I'd love to have five minutes with that person that was doing the documentary. I'd love to have five minutes because I feel that I'm moving the fullness and I feel it could provoke those to jealousy. Now, because he, the person in the documentary, meets up against ignorant Christians. Um, and not all of them were in the documentary at all. And it's, but because he does, does that give him an excuse to not recognize God? No, not at all. God says he speaks through his handiwork in the heavens every day. And he has all day long stretched out his hands by inscribing Israel on his palms of his hands when he died on the cross. So no, it's no excuse. But when we do move in our fullness, it's it's exciting. It's exciting to share with people. And you'll find people that are from that those cultural backgrounds, especially Israel, and also the sons of Ishmael, they're really interested in moving in, in the spirit. They really are interested. What about what are you talking about in tongues? Um I met this other Israeli man in a gym one day. I was working out and we started talking and I don't know even how it came up, probably because I'm always bringing it up. Um and he said to me, I must have said I'm a follower of Jesus. I said Christ at the time, which is fine. I just didn't understand. We should probably say Messiah. Um, but he said, I hate Jesus Christ. I hate Jesus Christ. And I said, why do you hate him? And he said, because he said he was God. And I said, well, then you should hate him. If you think that he's not God and he said he was God, a proper response from a person from Israel would be to hate Jesus Christ. I said, but what if he was God? And then he said, then I would worship him. So then I started talking about tongues, and I've had some amazing experiences speaking in tongues. Um, if you want to know about tongues, open the book of Acts and read about it and ask God about it, and we'll talk more about it at another teaching. I'll teach about tongues. But I have yet to reach a limit on how great tongues is. It's not only this personal prayer language of God. It also, I've sang in tongues, and people are healed and freed, and it's really beautiful. And I've also spoken in tongues to non-believers, and they've heard in another language something that profoundly affects their life, and they've been saved. So this came up in the gym. Uh... We start talking about tongues. I start talking about tongues. He said, what are these tongues? Tell me about these tongues. And this was all based on Peter, okay, when he stood up on the day of Pentecost, which is not really Pentecost. It's Pentecost in Greek. It's Shavuot. It's five weeks. It's the feast they celebrate at the first early harvest. And prophetically, when Peter got up on the first day of Shavuot, it was the first fruits of the church. So you understand how these feasts are fulfilled? And they were up all night. 
it says they were up all night, remember? Then the tongues of fire came in, and they began to speak with other tongues. Peter got up and was heard in something like 27 different dialects. They were up all night because the night before the Feast of Shavuot, you stay up all night and study the Torah. And that's what they were doing. These, these people were great Jews. They were great Jewish people. Peter was an amazing Jewish person who gave his life for the gospel of the Lord, his Messiah. So not meaning to get off on a track, but just that tongues is powerful. And so I spoke in tongues to this Israeli man in the gym, and his face went white. And he said, you just spoke to me in ancient Hebrew about Messiah. And, um, and he said, so it was more to the story, but it was astounding. It was astounding to me too. I was like, wow, God is so awesome. So then he asked me to pray for him and pray for his knee. And we did because he had an ailment. And he asked me to pray for him as he left. And he, I didn't see him again after that. But I assume he became a, a believer. Because you can't have an experience like that and not have it profoundly affect your life. So I was moving. If we move in power, we provoke the Israel to their fullness, to come into their fullness. And Romans is really clear that if by cutting them off, and blinding them, all of these Gentiles got saved. How much more is it going to be when they're saved? How much more fullness are we going to understand? So I want to uh, talk a little bit about how we got separated, how the church became a pagan believing church, and how we separated from the Jewish roots of the faith. Being a bridge... I want to try to bridge the gap. Oh, so going back, wait, sorry. I got to go back to Avishai. Well, that was the beginning of a dialogue for me between, because he was of the tribe of Aaron, which is a priestly tribe, and he was a cantor in the synagogue. And he sang to me in Hebrew. And when he sang, I just wept and wept. And I said, in my soul, there's something I need to know. Um, that began a dialogue because the way he talked to God was the way I talked to God. And we were both like, wait, we seem like we're both talking to God. So we got to find out more about God. Like he had to find out more about Messiah, which I pray he has found more about Messiah. And I had to for know more about my God who came from Israel and had those deep roots. It was so amazing. The dynamic that started and that's when I then started taking Hebrew and realized the gap and how great it was that I couldn't even communicate the gospel in a way that was a way that a Jewish person could understand and they want to know um, and we need to share it because the Bible says it's to the Jew first and then the Greek but um one of the comments in this book is that a Jewish woman who acknowledged Jesus as her Messiah shared her beliefs with a relative, and the relative responded, Jews don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah because Christians hate us. Okay, so how do we bridge the gap? Well, no, you know, no uh, God-fearing Jewish person is going to go in to a Lutheran or Catholic Church, most likely, because so many, uh, I um, can't think of the word, so many horrific things have happened in those denominations to the Jewish people, like the Crusades, Holocaust. Now, I've gone to a Lutheran church, and I love the people there, and I tried to help them understand the gap, and there's a lot of movement of this. I'm not the only one. There's many, 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 many people moving to make amends, to bridge, to restore the breach, um, to understand the roots of the faith, because it's the time. Right now, it's the time, because they their blindness comes off. 
And then the third arm comes in out of Egypt, which I believe are this proverbial, you know, sons of Ishmael, whoever they are. But they are mostly right now in the Islamic nations. So um, that's generalizing a lot. (laughs) But it's what I feel and see is happening. What What I feel and see is happening. So how did a movement that began as a sect of Judaism, which were the early believers, who were all Jewish, how did it become a legacy of hatred towards the Jews themselves? Well, there were a few things in the beginning, right after Jesus died and rose again, and then the Spirit of God poured out on Shavuot, Pentecost, and there was the first believers of the church. Well, they gathering together, believing, I'm not going to go all into that right now, but the first separation happened at the first Jewish revolt. And that happened at around uh, 70 AD. Uh, The temple was destroyed, and Jesus had said to his disciples, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies in Luke 21, 20 through 21, he said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that desolation is near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her. So the first separation happened because of the Jewish people. The ones who were believing, when they saw that the armies were surrounding Jerusalem, they obeyed what Messiah had told them, and they ran to the hills. And many of those people were saved, and they did not die. The other believers, um, I mean, the other Jewish people who were trying to revolt against the uh, destruction of the temple and against the Romans at that time, they went to Masad, I think it was Masada, and yes, Masada, and that's where they ended up committing suicide, almost a thousand of them committed suicide instead of being taken down by the Romans, so many of them were killed at that time, and they still rose up again, there was a second Jewish revolt, um, where they were following a person named Simon Bar Koba. Um, This was a revolt against the Romans, again, like establishing the earthly kingdom instead of the heavenly kingdom, which many times I feel that's what's really happening. The people are always trying to establish the kingdom on earth, kingdom now and dominion now. And um, this is not the kingdom that I'm not living in this kingdom. No way. (laughs) This is the kingdom I'm out of here. I'm in a spiritual house that I'm going to live forever, and I'm already in that house, but it's not going to be here forever. And even then the millennium happens, there'll be a new earth that says, a restored earth, the lion that lays down with the lamb. We go up to Israel every every year and and do our feast. So it's like, um, we'll talk more about that too, but I I always, I, I feel like just a simplification of it is trying to establish the kingdom on earth. Um, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this earth. He said, if it was, I would take the sword and fight. Now, when this revolt happened, the second revolt, many of the Jewish people got killed again, and the believers were not a part of it because they weren't trying to establish a kingdom on earth. It's a super simplification of it, but you can look it up if you'd like, the second Jewish revolt in 132 A.D. against the Romans. Okay, so now we're having even a larger separation between the believing, the new believers, and the, the Jews that didn't believe. But now they have no temple. And their whole religion centered around the temple and the sacrifice. Well, Jesus said, I am the sacrifice. I'm the Passover lamb. He was the one who died. He made the blood sacrifice. And that was done forever and ever and ever and ever. And at that point, he became the temple where we worship because he made the sacrifice. So 
there was no more need for the temple. And the Jewish people who really wanted to follow God, even though they didn't understand the Messiah, they had to set up a way to follow God. So led by certain rabbis, uh, they set up rabbinical Judaism. So that was establishing the Mishnah, the oral laws, the rabbinical laws that people need to follow. So it's like it was establishing a righteousness in themselves. Like we have to now be righteous and it's a faith. I mean, it became a religion based on works. The religion, even in the Old Covenant, in the Tanakh, the Tanakh is the Old Testament. The Torah is the five first books of the Bible. The Tanakh is all the Old Covenant or Old Testament. It's called the Tanakh. So if you ever need to know that. Then there's the New Covenant, which we call the New Testament. So, but... But Torah is also used for just word, like for the word of God, the Torah of God. It's like um, we study the Torah because we study the word. Their, their faith, their religion was based on the sacrifice that happened. And they believed that the life was in the blood. So even now, a typical Jewish person, even though I don't know a lot about everything, but I know a little bit. <laughs> is that they drain the blood from the meat before they eat it because they believe that the life is in the blood. God's like life is in the blood. It's sacred. And so they knew very well what Jesus was saying when he said, drink my blood. That meant that he was saying, I'm the life. I have the life. Drink my blood. Um, this was very clear to them. Now we have diminished that fact, but that blood was very, very, very sacred. And it was only if you were sacred and holy could you drink the blood. So um, that's just like a sounding. And anyway, so that happened where they began, the non-believing Jews had their, their religious um, works now. They had their rabbinical laws, they have the oral law, and they began to have their religion of works, which they continue to have to this day. And, you know, it's exhausting, and I feel really, I feel really burdened, like Paul, to be zealous for them. Um, it says, brethren, in Romans 10, 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel, that they might be saved. For they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of God's righteousness. And what is God's righteousness? Messiah, our Savior. He is our righteousness. Being ignorant of that righteousness, they went about to establish their own righteousness. And have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. So their religion is one of like self-righteousness, but it's out of zeal. I mean, I really admire their zeal. I mean, do you know how many law, rabbinical laws surround the law of not putting milk and meat together, which is like one of the basic rules to eat kosher? Um, you know, it says in that you will not boil a calf in the mother's milk. That's why they believe that you separate the milk and the meat. So, But they've gone so far as to create so many laws around it, but it's not because they're like you know, love these laws, you're neurotic about these laws, they, they, are, they don't want to break the main laws, the ones that are in the Bible. So they created a lot of laws around them so that by the time you've broken that one law after another law, hopefully you've gotten some warnings, signs that you're breaking the laws before you get to the main laws. So I have a lot of respect, a lot of respect for Orthodox Jewish people who are zealous for God. Because they really believe that they have to be righteous to be with God. And we do. We have to be perfect. So we believe that Jesus, being perfect, perfectly sacrificed himself for us. So we have taken that atonement. We have drank the blood. 
We have let the blood come over us, and we are clothed in his righteousness. So now we're free from the works, and we can go about to do good works and glorify God, but not be rooting down by them. And I found it really interesting at the, the university where I was going, learning Hebrew, because in our class, we had some Orthodox Jews, some Reformed Jews. We had me, um, a Gentile believer in Messiah. Um, we had some converted Jews who were getting married to Jewish people. But one day it was so funny because they all knew that I was moving in some kind of power with God. There was a definite respect for me in the class. Um, but we had a little lunch and we brought latkes, you know. And um, so one of the ladies who's Orthodox, she she couldn't eat my latkes because I wasn't making them in a kosher kitchen. Oh, I can't touch your latkes, you know. But yet she asked me for prayer because she was having a struggle, a physical struggle, and I prayed for her. And I thought, well, it's not interesting, you know. <laughs> it's amazing. But basically, every other religious system is to trap you into works. It's to trap you into establishing your own righteousness instead of being reliant on a righteous God who sacrificed and we're in this mercy. We're in this mercy place. I mean, I've read the Quran a few times out of wanting to understand. And I also have a respect for persons who are zealous for God. Even if it's not according to knowledge, I would like to share the knowledge that I have with them so they can be freed. But if you are zealous in your faith, when you go to your mosque and you're praying five times a day and you're going to your synagogue or you're going to your temple or you're doing your chanting, whatever you're doing, I have a lot of respect for you. I don't not respect you. I have an amazing amount of respect for you. You're seeking. You are trying to please a God that you understand in or that you want to understand in. But what I'm saying is, there is no freedom in it. There's no way to get close to God and have intimate fellowship with God until we understand that there is one sacrifice that was made, one door opened, and we can come in and have fellowship with God and be free. And so in reading the Quran, I want to understand more about Allah because he says he's merciful. He's a merciful God, it says. And but I don't see any pictures. I don't see any stories in the Quran of his mercy. I actually get afraid. It's the, it seems like a severe God. The God of the Old Testament is afraid. I get afraid of him. He seems severe. He is severe. Now, I'm not comparing those two books. I don't think they're anywhere. They're not equal at all. I really believe that in the Quran, there's a, 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 I don't know how to say it without really saying it, but there isn't a picture of a merciful God who loves. And there seems to be a lot of contradictions. Allah cannot be a trinity, and yet he calls himself a we. And I can go into a whole series on that. But when I pray in the Spirit, because God is wanting to call out his people to himself who are trapped under religious systems. And you might be trapped under Tibetan Buddhism. You might be trapped under the system and trying to please this God or gods or whoever you're trying to please. You might be trapped under Hinduism. You might be trapped. You, what I'm saying is you're trapped. And God came through Jesus to set you free. He came to set you free. And I believe that he will set you free if you call out to him. And otherwise you're you can't have fellowship with a with a with a system. You can only have fellowship with a God who is above all and in all and you're complete in him. It's like when I 
it would pray for s s like um, people in Islam. It seems like they're they're trying to suck um, water out of a dry earth, and there's no water, but they really want the water. And what Jesus was saying on the Feast of Sukkot is, "Drink of me, and you will have everlasting water pouring out of your belly." And you really do have that. It's it's an amazing, amazing thing. I can have fellowship with God whenever I want. And do I want to please him? Yeah, I do. I really want to please God. And he says he's pleased by my faith. And I think it really pleases him when I reach out and try to love people. But do I, am I pleasing like him because I'm perfect or I'm trying to establish my own righteousness? No way. No way, no way, no way. I mean, people are respect so much, are people zealous for God, but just keep going the distance until you really, 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 really know him. I mean, you really know him because many will come in the last day and say, didn't we do mighty works in your name? And he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. He says he dwells with the humble of heart. He says he dwells in a high and holy place and with those who are of a humble heart. So he will dwell in the humility of your heart. And you can see the Lord. You can see him. I don't care what you call yourself. If you're not reflecting his grace or reflecting his love, I don't believe in having fellowship with God. You can... Maybe you are. I don't know. But Jesus says we'll know them by their fruits. And the fruits are peace, joy, gentleness, faith, temperance, meekness, self-control. Are my fruits perfect on my tree? No, they're not. But generally, as I have followed the Lord over years and years and years, I have been more and more fruit-bearing. Mother Teresa, she's like, my hero, she was incredibly fruit bearing. Look at the fruit that poured out of her life. Look at how many cups of water and how many people she clothed. I mean, I love her book. That's I think it's called Love. It says, um, she says people are always looking for the Lord, um, but he's right there because he says if you give someone a cup of water in my name, you've just given it to me. He says, if you clothe somebody, if you feed somebody, if you visit somebody who's sick or in prison, you've just done it to the Lord. So you want to serve the Lord one easy, simple way. And you don't have to get into a whole, like, dissertation on it. Go out and just help somebody who needs help. Because the Lord says, you've just done it to me. It's like a worshiping the Lord when you do that. So... I believe God has his people, his sheep, and they're all over the world. And they are in fellowship or becoming into fellowship. Or they, when they hear the word, they, they, the fruit starts to manifest in their life. A lot of people are on their way to knowing God. I mean, if they even hear you, the Bible says if they've received you, they receive the one who sent you. So you don't have to seal the deal. God seals the deal. He seals the deal on their heart. You don't have to seal the deal. What you have to do is be humble. <laughs> be humble and be a bridge and try to understand where they're coming from and how trapped they are, how oppressed they are trying to serve these unforgiving gods and these unforgiving systems that, and these unforgiving laws that are so um, oppressive. So try to be a bridge and try to be a bridge. Um, when we've had this gap, this 1700 year gap with, when we cut ourselves off from the roots of the faith, we have 1700 years to make up for. So it's not going to happen overnight. You've got to be humble as a believer and make a way. So after the rabbinical laws were established, um, what came into play was a Greek worldview. And there was a council that took place that literally severed the church. At that time, it was saying, we denounce all Jewish feasts, all rites, all customs. Basically, you cannot be connected 
with your roots anymore. And I'm going to talk about that at a later date. That was called the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. Lots of info on that on the internet. You can look it up. Um, but it started with the whole world view of that changed the center of Christianity from Jerusalem to the Greek worldview over to, where was it? I'll say the wrong thing, but I'll, it's into the Greek worldview where things became, um, they became like metaphors or analogous. They weren't literal anymore. So I want you to think about that. Think about getting back to your roots of your faith and understanding literal Israel and understanding the time that we're in. So I will do another talk soon. And I'm sure that I want to end this in prayer. Father, I pray in your name, Lord, the name above every name. I pray in your name. Lord, you reached in and you saved me when I was lost and I was trapped. And I pray, Lord God, you would reach out right now through this message to anyone, anyone who would call upon your name, Father, that you would lift them out of the mire, that you would deliver them from the systems that they're in, the religious systems that are keeping them from you, Lord, that you would break condemnation right now, you would break the prison and lies that they're in right now in Jesus' name. And they would come out and have fellowship with you. Lord, I pray you would help me not to hold you back but to let you speak um i pray lord god that you would cover over every person every true believer who's trying to understand you who is trying to share you lord in every country any nation you know who they are i ask you to strengthen them and build them up in your faith with your roots father god and we praise you and we thank you i praise you lord i praise you father god i pray that blindness comes off people's eyes even right now as we're here together i pray your eyes are open and you can see and i pray for the humility in, in your heart that allows god to be able to dwell with you and i pray your mercy is over us lord let this be the mercy seat let this time be the mercy seat i'm I'm just presenting you as the mercy seat. So I thank you and I praise you, Father. I praise you, Jesus. Call him out and call him forth and let him be free. In Jesus' name.